This lecture provides an introduction to stopping sight distance within the context of geometric design of highway facilities. And after today's lecture, students should be familiar with the factors that affect stopping sight distance. They should be able to calculate stopping sight distance. And they should be familiar also with the concepts of decision sight distance and passing sight distance. So first of all, sight distance in general is the driver's ability to see ahead, which is, of course, critical to safe and efficient highway operations. And when we talk about sight distance, there are four primary types of sight distances which we encounter in geometric design. And those are stopping sight distance, decision sight distance, passing sight distance, and intersection sight distance. And so we'll get into each of these at varying degrees over the course of CE 355. But the primary emphasis today will be on the first three, stopping decision and passing sight distance. So the first of these, which is likely the most important when we look at geometric design of roadways, is stopping sight distance, which the definition from the Ashto Green Book is the minimum sight distance required for a driver to stop a vehicle after seeing an object in the roadway without hitting that object. So essentially a driver needs to be able to identify an object in the road ahead of them, make the determination that they need to stop, and then go through the actual physical process of stopping prior to striking the object. And in doing so, we want to make sure that we provide sufficient distance so that a below average driver can stop. If we design for the average driver, that means that half of the drivers would basically end up striking that object. So we generally design such that we're able to accommodate 85 to 95 percent of drivers um, and greater lengths are generally desirable if possible. And so when we look at stopping sight distance, the natural question is why is it important? And so as we've indicated, there may be circumstances in which you would want to be able to stop your vehicle quickly in order to avoid an impending collision. And so from a design standpoint, stopping sight distance or SSD influences several factors, including the lengths of vertical curves. So for example, if you're coming over a crest, you'll notice here, once you get over that crest, it's difficult to see objects on the other side. So you want to make sure that this curve would be long enough in that transition gradual enough so that you don't strike an object on the other side of the hill. Uh, at nighttime, it's a slightly different circumstance. We're more concerned with sag curves, so where you're going downhill and your path is only illuminated by your vehicle's headlights. So this is another circumstance where we need to ensure we have a gradual transition. And then a third example in vertical curve design is if we have an underpass going under a railroad track here in this instance. We want to make sure that we're providing sufficient distance. So let's say there's a traffic signal downstream of this bridge structure or some other object that requires a stopping maneuver. So we want to make sure that we have sufficient vertical clearance here as well. Um, it's also going to be a concern in horizontal curve design. So you want to make sure that your horizontal curve is gradual enough so that you're able to see any potential collision on the road up ahead of you. And then likewise, we want to make sure that we have sufficient offset on the inside of the curve so that there's nothing restricting our sight distance. So these are just a few examples of how SSD influences the highway design process. And so when we're trying to determine or estimate stopping sight distance for a given location, we're basically concerned with the two components of stopping sight distance, reaction distance and braking distance. So reaction distance is the physical distance from which the driver first sees an object in the roadway to the point when they begin applying the brakes. So this is basically accounting for perception reaction time. And once they make the decision to hit the brakes, then we're concerned with the braking distance, which goes back to our fundamental equations from physics which are calculated here up to the point where the object is located in the roadway ahead. So the formula here, SSD stopping sight distance is equal to the reaction distance plus the braking distance. And so starting with the perception reaction distance, uh, perception reaction time is essentially a measure of how quickly people are able to react to a situation and that's going to be a function of various factors including how much information the driver is expected to process, how expectant the driver is of needing to stop, how alert they are, and then how complex that message is. So if we look at the human factors research that underlies a lot of our design work in this area, this is a plot of median driver reaction times depending upon how complex a message is that's being received. 
So as you see here, as that message becomes more complex, as we add more bits of information, um, reaction times are obviously increasing. And we also see in an unexpected situation versus an expected situation, it takes longer for drivers to react to some cue that's unexpected. Continuing on, 85th percentile, so this is on the same axes, and we see in order to accommodate a larger percentage of the population, we'd have to consider higher reaction times here. And so when we're trying to calculate the perception reaction distance, there's essentially two components of concern here. A, what is the assumed perception reaction time for a driver, a design driver in this circumstance? And then what is the speed of that vehicle during that perception reaction time period? And so when we look at perception reaction times, quote unquote normal reaction times generally range from 0.75 to one and a half seconds. Uh, under alert situations, so where drivers are expecting to have to stop or change their behavior in response to various cues, um, we're assuming one and a half seconds, for example, on urban streets. More typically though, particularly when we talk about stopping sight distance, we deal with the unalerted situation. So drivers may not be anticipating a stop. And so we generally assume a design value of T sub R of 2.5 seconds, which is also from the Ashto Green book. And this would accommodate roughly 90 to 95% of drivers. From a speed standpoint, for design purposes, we're typically going to use the design speed of a facility. And then for analysis or forensic studies, for example, crash reconstruction, we would try to use an actual or estimated speed based on various measurable characteristics from the roadway. So. A quick example, so let's assume we have a driver traveling at 65 miles per hour and they see a blocked road up ahead. We'd like to know how many feet the vehicle will travel between the time the driver notices the sign and the time the brakes are applied. So what's the perception reaction distance, D sub R? And so the formula for perception reaction distance is really simple. We're simply taking the reaction time, which is going to be in seconds, and then multiply that by the speed, which is in feet per second. It's simply time times speed. Or if our speeds are in miles per hour, we would need to convert that speed, uh, which we simply multiply by the speed in miles per hour by 1.47, which is 5280 divided by 3600. So that gets us from miles per hour to feet per second. And so either of these then will give us a reaction distance measured in feet. And so for our given problem here, our reaction distance at 65 miles per hour is approximately 239 feet. And so that's the first component. The second component then, of course, is the braking distance. So once the driver actually starts to apply the brakes, we need to determine how far that vehicle is going to travel before it's able to stop. And so there's four primary factors that are going to influence that braking distance. The first of which is speed. Obviously, at higher speeds, we're going to require larger stopping distances. How much friction is occurring at the tire uh, road surface interface and obviously the more friction we have there the lesser that stopping distance would be required uh, the grade so we would obviously need a lesser distance if we're going up a grade as opposed to down a grade um, with level grade being in the middle and then deceleration rate so depending upon how fast those drivers are able to decelerate that's going to have an obvious influence as well and so in order to calculate braking distance we go back to our fundamental kinematics equations which you are probably familiar with from physics so we have acceleration is simply the difference in the initial and final speeds over time we have the distance is equal to our initial speed times time plus one half acceleration times time squared and then lastly the square of our final velocity is equal to the square of our initial velocity plus two times that acceleration times the distance the vehicle travels and so by simply rearranging this series of equations we can then determine that the braking distance assuming we've got a level grade is just simply the difference in our initial and final speeds squared divided by two times our deceleration rate. And so here we have essentially five different quantities that we're concerned with. Some of these will be measured, some of these will be assumed, and some of these will be computed. And it's going to be rare that we can actually measure all of these in, in the field. So we're generally going to have to make some assumptions for design or analysis purposes. So. If we go back and revisit that braking distance equation we just introduced, we can rearrange these terms and incorporate the gravitational constant into this. So rather than just having the difference in squared velocities over 2a, 
what we do is we account for the effects of friction essentially by taking the deceleration rate divided by the gravitational constant. So as you'll see here, gravity cancels out and this is equal to 2a. So what we're concerned with here is essentially the deceleration rate or how much frictional force is being applied and how that's helping that vehicle to decelerate. We also add a correction term here for grade and so if the vehicle is going uphill this would be a plus sign so a positive grade which means the braking distance would be lesser. If this was a minus sign they're going downhill the denominator would be lower and we'd require a larger braking distance here obviously so those terms as defined previously and continuing from the previous slide we can simplify this equation generally for design purposes we know that the gravitational constant is 32.2 feet per second squared we're typically going to work with speeds in terms of miles per hour and so we would obviously want to convert uh, 1.47 and that quantity would have to be squared actually here since those velocities are squared and so the ashto design equation which takes that A over G I referred to and refers to it as just a general friction factor. Our braking distance is simply our velocity squared over 30 times F plus or minus G. And so that's just telling us that our braking distance is our initial velocity squared. The final velocity term is assumed to be zero since these vehicles are coming to a complete stop. So that drops out of the equation. The friction coefficient is simply equal to A over G as noted on the prior slide. And the grade here, a quick note, it's important that this would be expressed in decimal format. So if you're going down a 7% grade, it would be minus 0 0.07 rather than 7. Now, a natural question is, what do we assume for a deceleration rate? And so the typical design assumption under normal, normal circumstances is 11.2 feet per second squared, which is a very comfortable deceleration rate. The research has shown that in emergency situations, the majority of drivers can stop at rates greater than 14.8 feet per second squared, um, upwards of 20 or more feet per second squared. So these are relatively conservative design assumptions. And then we also need to make some assumptions in terms of that frictional factor. And so we would expect those deceleration rates would be less on poor pavement conditions. And so if we've got good tires on good pavement, we can actually see deceleration rates of up to 0.85 Gs. Uh, wet pavement, even if we've got bald tires, we can generate up to 0.4 Gs. And then it gets particularly bad under snowy and icy conditions where we can just generate a fraction, 0.22 or 0.15 Gs. And so in, in addition to this, it also depends on the weight of the vehicle, but we generally make some standard assumptions to arrive at the fundamental equation that we'll see on the following page here. So the general equation for stopping sight distance is d sub r, which is simply 1.47 times the reaction time times the initial speed in miles per hour, plus the kinematic braking portion of that equation, which is simply the initial velocity squared over 30 times the quantity F plus or minus G. And so this equation can obviously then be applied to determine the stopping sight distance for given conditions, or if we know how far a vehicle has traveled, um, let's say leading up to a collision, we could back calculate to try to determine what speeds, the initial or final speeds of those vehicles were at impact. There's various ways we can try to use this equation. We could evaluate potential changes to some design constraints. So what happens if we increase or decrease the reaction time, if we change the surface conditions and so forth and so on. Now beyond stopping sight distance, uh, decision sight distance is also an important concern. And so decision sight distance is the amount of distance that's required for a driver to detect some sort of unexpected um, or difficult to perceive hazard in the roadway. Um, and that could be due to a variety of factors. We could have visual clutter, there could be a work zone. So something that causes a change in the normal roadway conditions. And the driver needs to be able to recognize the potential threat for a crash and then be able to change their speed and or their path on the roadway leading up to 
um, whatever that obstacle may be, and then to be able to complete their driving maneuver safely and efficiently. And so when we think about decision site distance, this is basically when we're running into complex or unexpected situations in the roadway. So a work zone would be a very good example of this. So if you're having to shift lanes or move over to the opposite side of the road, that's an atypical situation. So we need to make sure that we provide motorists with sufficient time in order to perform evasive maneuvers in these circumstances. And so we allow additional sight distance beyond just the SSDs to increase our margin of error. So stopping's not necessarily required or desirable in these settings, but we want to be able to ensure that we're providing at least that amount of distance with some additional buffer here. And so there are a few examples. Um, anytime we've got interchanges or intersections where we have unusual maneuvers, so any atypically designed intersections or interchanges, uh, we'd want to provide additional time in advance of those additional distance uh, for vehicles to transition through them. If there's a change in the cross section, so if you're adding a travel lane or removing a travel lane, if we're uh, approaching a toll plaza or some other complex environment, and then also if we've got areas that have a lot of visual noise, so if there's a lot of things going down in an intense urban environment, and a work zone would be another good example here. Those would be examples where decision site distance is very important. And so if we think about this conceptually, here's a, an example that you may have seen something similar to this. So we're coming over a steep vertical curve, and it appears as if this road is continuing on into the distance. Now, once we actually get across the top of this crest, we'll notice the road is actually curving, and this is actually a, a side road, which is problematic if drivers aren't aware of that sufficiently far enough in advance and so when we talk about decision site distance there are five general types of avoidance maneuvers that are accommodated in the ashto green book two of those relate to stopping so we would be considering both perception reaction time and stopping distance and then there are three additional maneuvers that simply relate back to speed path and directional changes in which case we really only are concerned with the perception reaction time since those vehicles aren't having to come to a complete stop they just need to be able to make the determination of how they change their normal travel behaviors and so starting with the stopping example we're providing less time on a rural roadway and more time on an ur urban roadway for these types of changes and the reason for that is that there's just a lot more happening in an urban setting and so consequently due to the fewer distractions in the rural environment we generally don't need to provide as much advance notice as would otherwise be the case and speed path and directional changes we have different design values for rural roads suburban roads and urban roads and similarly in this setting the more urbanized the area, the greater the assumed time we need to provide in order for decision site distance to be satisfied. And so the following is just the tabular value of decision site distances, and we'll see how those compare to speed as well as the stopping site distance. So as we get to the more complex maneuvers, we'll see that our decision site distance is increasing. And even in the least severe case where we have the rural um, stopping scenario we're providing beyond just the simple stopping site distance in each of these instances and given the increasing complexity we see in these additional environments we're providing additional distance beyond that as well. Passing site distance is also a circumstance which we're frequently trying to design for so this is a particular concern on two-lane highways where we need to pass in the opposing direction of traffic and so in order to do that we need to try to estimate how much time and then how much distance would be required to pass a slower moving vehicle and that's going to be a function of several factors including the speed of the passing vehicle and the vehicle that's being passed as well as our ability to see vehicles coming in the opposite direction and so in this circumstance this is a table of ashto recommended passing site distance values and so you'll notice here for various design speeds we make assumptions as to what the speed of the slower moving or impeding vehicle would be at the time of passing and then also what the speed of the passing vehicle would be. Now in looking at these values you'll notice the speeds of the vehicles being passed appear to be a bit on the low side so our design speed of 55 and we're assuming 43 miles per hour for the passed vehicle 55 for the passing vehicle now keep in mind this design speed is likely to be several miles per hour above the speed limit and so that helps to explain 
why we see this relationship. Now, practically speaking, maybe this speed is higher and maybe this speed is higher as well, but generally we're making conservative assumptions here and our passing site distance is simply illustrated over here. And if we compare those values to stopping site distance, we're obviously going to provide much greater distance here because we've got that complexity of vehicles approaching us at high speed in the opposite direction and then us trying to overcome a vehicle as well. And so consequently, we're generally looking Looking at nearly double the length in most of these instances and so this was just a very brief introduction to the three primary site distances we're concerned with for geometric design and we will continue using these as we move forward with vertical and horizontal curve design